Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the AFC's Roundup Podcast. I'm your host, Bill's season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And in studio with us tonight, Dr. Kyle Trimble of bangedupbills.com. Kyle, what a day. What a day is right. What a day to be a Bills fan. And what a day just for you to... Like, we're for, for those of you who have... <laughs> Well, you, you schedule for those of you who have ever scheduled anything on a podcast or any sort of professional, like whoever had to do anything like this, you schedule these things days and sometimes weeks in advance. And yet this there's an there's an irony to the fact that we're both here doing this today, isn't there? There really is. I mean, we we had a lot to talk about and we will talk about tonight. But just the fact the latest news of today being Thursday and everything that's happened you're like, you couldn't have planned this better from a breaking news standpoint, but you don't want to be talking about this stuff either, especially mid-August. No, absolutely not. So I think today is actually the perfect time for the podcast we're about to record because there's this dynamic that exists. Like the preseason is crazy when you think about it. Like, Chris, you find yourself, if you think about what preseason football is, you're cheering for players that probably won't see the field this season at all for the most part. And for some of them, maybe ever. But that's just going to be the extent of their NFL career is the one time that Christian Wade runs back, a, has like a 73-yard run for a touchdown, mm-hmm. and everyone can lose their minds about it. And then we never hear about that guy again. Yep. There's going to be a See, lot of guys. I, I gave up on Saturday's <clears throat> game at halftime because Jessica was like, hey, I broke a shower ring. <laughs> now I can't put the shower curtain back up. Well, the starters are out. I'll go to Target and get you shower rings so that we may have a a shower curtain where a ring goes into each hole and we're not OCD about that one missing fucking ring. And, And it's just funny, right? Because then you also get to watch guys who, you know, have historically been quality football players. You get to watch them not be able to find their ass with both hands and you have to just shrug and go. Yeah, the preseason's crazy sometimes, right? <laughs> like, you think back to the Bills' performance and everything we talked about during Tuesday's podcast, just the idea that there were some things that I know are good that were just awful, mm-hmm. and there's nothing you can do about that. It's just, it's the day, it's it's what the preseason is for. Yeah, you, know, you, you can watch those guys go out there, like Terrell Bernard, who you know is a great linebacker, and, should, and I mean, who did, didn't have a terrible game. But then you can also go out there and watch guys who you're like, well, Dorian Williams isn't great, but he's also not terrible. And you can watch him look like Brucey from the longest yard. And you go, <laughs> what the fuck is happening? You can even go watch your team get outscored by 27 points and have it roll off your back like it's nothing, because that's the beauty of the preseason. It doesn't matter for the most part. What's not Great as the injuries. Those are the permanent things. Those are the things that stick with you. Sometimes can derail a season. Sometimes, like once, because this is the thing right now, this is still like you go into the season and you think like preseason, okay, I'm going to see this and I'm going to get a look at my depth players and everything else. The wins don't matter. But as the proverbial bullets start flying, the injuries absolutely do. I mean, just. Ask any Vikings fan today how they feel. Like, I saw a thing. It's wild, right? They've drafted, as a franchise, the Vikings have drafted five first-round quarterbacks. Two got career-ending knee injuries. One's career was defined by repeated injuries. This according to Luke Braun, NFL, on Twitter. The latest one got a season-ender in his first preseason game, and the other one is Christian Ponder. Like, that's fucking wild. That is horrible luck. I mean, the Vikings are almost like the NFC version of the Bills in terms of they've had great moments, but they can never get over the hump. But then to hear all that stuff, thankfully, we haven't had that luck with the quarterbacks. But when you put that in perspective, I'm like, okay, Teddy Bridgewater, okay, Sam Bradford, and then you mentioned J.J. McCarthy, um, you know, Christian Ponder. I'm trying to think who the other one was, but like, that is horrible luck and you can't do anything about it. 
And then you take a look at what else has happened to them since they started their preseason. They lose their starting cornerback the first day of practice. First day of practice, he tears an ACL. He's done for the year. Yep. Then they go out and have a, their CB2 suffer another knee injury. And it's like, okay, we're going to, we're falling down the depth chart here. Then TJ Hawkinson, he's out. He's not going to be back until middle, late of the season. So they're down a premium weapon. Then Jordan Addison gets a DUI and then gets hurt, catches an ankle injury in practice. Then their quarterback, the guy who they're like, oh, the future of our franchise. He goes out with a knee injury and misses the whole year. He's the first quarterback in NFL history to... to 67. The the first rookie quarterback, the first one to be drafted in the first round and miss the season before he ever got to play a game. I did not know that. And it's... It was like the first time since 67. Wow. Yeah. And and to add into their misfortune, too, they had a player die during the offseason. And that was it. They're like, they had a player die. It's like, dude, these things just pile up and start to... In a vacuum, you say, okay, next man up, how do I do this? But once, like in totality, they can define a season. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I always like having you come in ahead of the season so we can take a look at just the preseason process Mm -hmm. and where teams stand as far as injuries. Because I think if you're only looking at yourself, you know, if every Jets fan only looks at themselves as, hey, the Jets, this is where my focus is, all of these injuries and all these things can feel huge. But you got to take into account the landscape. Right. Some teams are always going to be better off than others. The Bills last year had all five starters on their offensive line for an entire season, which is almost unheard of. And it probably won't happen again. Probably won't happen again. But it's that concept of look at all the other teams that thought they might have been contenders and then just got ravaged by injuries on their offensive line or at the skill positions. So with it in mind, I think that it's a good exercise to always get together. Plus, it's always just fun getting. It's a good hang. <laughs> this is the only podcast I go on. No offense, to the other ones. I get to drink and more or less shoot the breeze. First, you know, the other ones are a little more buttoned up, but each of them have their own style that they go towards. Sure. And the thing is, they haven't. <laughs> those guys just haven't figured out how to have a good time yet. <laughs> At least that's what I keep telling myself. So. With that in mind, we're here tonight to take a look around the AFC East and talk about some of the most prominent injury woes they have in order to kind of give us perspective, which I think is important specifically on a day like today. Like, it's good to have, but I feel like fans could use something. I agree. (laughs) They need something. And so with that said, I want to start with the factory of sadness that is the New York Jets. Okay. Let's start here. Aaron Rodgers. The lightning rod that he is, although he, Chris, I've never seen somebody get, like, do things to earn so much attention and then pretend they don't want it. I've never seen it quite like Aaron Rodgers can dole it out. Like, his brand is just, <laughs> Yeah, I like it. <laughs> he sucks. Like, I don't mean as a football player. I just mean as a dude. I think he just sucks. I, I You can see, like, if I, like I, the fact that his family doesn't like him. Doesn't shock me. If I had a if I had to be related to that guy, I probably wouldn't talk to him. Either. Well, that's because yeah. of Olivia Munn. That's <laughs> she's the reason that he's not talking to his family anymore. Didn't she just have a baby with John Mulaney too? Like she's not even in the picture and stuff. Like she's been gone for years. Right? I think I think the thing is he's always sucked, and his family knew it. And Olivia Olivia Munn was just the, like that's the straw that broke the camel's back. It might be. It might be. <laughs> So Aaron Rodgers making this heroic comeback from a hilarious four second 2023 debut. Um, they had him run out with the fucking flag. It's like you made this whole show about Aaron Rodgers. The narcissism just drips off this guy. And so it's kind of comical to see how that all ended. Like it, You made him the focal point, both visually from an optic standpoint and also from a play calling standpoint. He was the thing from a roster building standpoint. He was going to be your team, and without him, you had nothing. So, he's back throwing the football. He's making headlines, he's doing press, and he's doing things to get attention, and then claiming, you know, the the typical Aaron Rodgers stuff. He seems like he's back in, like, mid-season form already. And yet, one of the things I find interesting is that during all the videos, that, like, even the Jets' Twitter handle, when it puts out these highlight reels of, oh, here's a a dime from Rodgers to, you know, to, to Wilson, I keep seeing comments about people talking about just his mechanics and how it still doesn't look right. 
Where do you fall on this when you look at somebody who's coming back from an Achilles tear? And can you talk about drop foot a little bit? So I have looked at mechanics. We don't have a lot of quarterbacks who have suffered Achilles tears. I mean, we had two last year, but really the only previous ones that were notable were Vinny Testaverde and Dan Marino, and that was 20, 30 years ago. So we don't have a lot of comparison when we're looking at the Achilles tears as how the mechanics are. I, I don't know that the mechanics are bad. He is throwing around. He is doing everything he needs to do. They might look different. He might have had to change things to compensate for lack of arm strength because he's 40 years old. It could be, you know, maybe he does have some push off issues, you know, because we do see that after Achilles loss of power. But this is also the foot he steps into instead of his power foot, you know. Mm -hmm. So there might be. But if there was really concerns, I think he would have really tried to address that. I mean, he has the resources. The team has resources to look at Mm -hmm. that stuff. So I don't know. I You kind of look at something might look funny, but. Is it a problem or is it not? And you look at that like in PT in general, sure. you know, so something might look funny, but if you're not having pain with it, if there's not any risk for injury, sometimes you don't mess with it there. So that might be one of the situations where you just say, hey, it might look different, but it's working and you just kind of run with it because then you start tinkering and then you could cause issues that were not there. So in terms of risk of re-injury or ancillary compensation injuries, what do you think about the prognosis of a 40 something year old man coming back from this injury to play football at a high level at full speed. What are we looking at in terms of a risk of re injury? Yeah, re- just compa- or, or- compare it to Aaron Rodgers' Achilles and me and my back because we're about the same age. Yeah. Both athletes, <laughs> you can compare it, compare it to them. Uh, Jeez, uh, you have a higher risk of re-injury than Aaron Rodgers at this point. <laughs> so, uh, but that, that that is a good comparison. You know, age, supposedly athletic, uh-huh. supposedly suppo- age, supposed athleticism, and hair. I feel like those are the three things that they might have in common. Maybe, maybe. So, yeah, the re-injury risk for Achilles is low. It's like okay. I think NFL is like 15 percent, and that's just because it's such a small sample size. And you're looking at everybody and quarterback. Yeah, there's so many rules to protect those guys. I'm not really worried about him re-injuring it. It just I'm worried about him being 40 years old. And can he make it through a whole nother season? I'm thinking about like compensation injuries, like a perfect example. I threw my back out two weeks ago. Yeah, I'm rehabbing my way through that. Also, not an athlete. I've had to buy an inversion table. Like things have gotten. I have compressed. They they figured out I have compressed. uh, I have compressed discs in my back from a car accident I sustained a long time ago. So, like this is now all starting to become a problem. They've given me all these things that I have to do to try to address it. But in the meantime, what I've noticed is in compensating for it since the like the actual the initial like aggravation. I have like hip soreness and I've noticed that there's other things that will now hurt because I'm trying to compensate for not being able to just stand up, spine straight, walk in a straight line or do things using the normal mechanics. So in terms of that, I feel like that's probably something this, especially when you're coming off of something like this, we're talking about the mechanics being different. Maybe Yep. he's going to be looking at hamstring. He's going to be looking at some calf, um, you don't really see gluteal, mm-hmm. but like you do use that to help push off and everything. So he's going to rely more on pushing off of the hamstrings and butt to drive himself forward, especially if he doesn't have as much power coming off of that uh, right. I believe it's the right side mm-hmm. that if he had not injured the area. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we might see that. Will it translate to him being an injury report for that? I don't know. Um, we might see that more if he's having to scramble, but he's never been a really mobile quarterback to begin with. My th- my thing for him is pocket mobility. Yeah. Your agility to kind of dance around within a small window and just buy yourself time. And I wonder about a 17-week season and just as those, like I said, that comp- the compensatory stuff. Yeah. As it starts to build week over week, because there's only so much, you know, it firsthand, there's only so much rehab these guys get. Yeah. Now he's your golden goose. So you're going to give him first dibs on yeah. every trainer, every yeah. session he needs. But it's still 17 weeks of football. And his offensive line is still mm-hmm. a suspect, even after all the resources. And so that brings me to the next guy on the Jets list, Tyron Smith who I've seen Jets fans beating their chest about how they got such a deal on him. And, oh, this guy's been, when he was good, he's been great. It's like, yeah, but he's been injured a lot, which is why the Cowboys cut bait. Mm-hmm. I look at him and I look at Becton and I almost get the feeling that, like, he's at the place in his career where he's almost at the same level of being this ticking time bomb for injury that Becton was. 
He just has a more proven body of work at an NFL level. Is that a fair thing to say? It is. And I'm thinking I'd rather have Becton at this point looking at Smith's injury history. So So what are we looking at with him? With Smith? With Smith. Just to give the listeners an idea of what we're talking about. I'm pulling up his uh, stuff from um, when I did my article. I mean, let me ask you this. Is your website down? No, it's not. I, I I listened to that and then I texted you right after the fact. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. It's down for maintenance when you need it. Like I actually switched over to different server so that didn't happen. And you know, it's just is what it is, but you know, it works better with the new server, but like I made sure that I moved stuff around so that stuff doesn't happen. Then you come in and blast out to the world. So thanks. Yeah, know? thanks, Chris. Your horse's ass. <laughs> So anyway, look at Tyron Smith. I mean, last year alone, he dealt with ankle, knee, neck, and back injuries. <laughs> In 2022, he missed the first 13 games due to a hamstring avulsion fracture. That's where the bone actually, or the muscle actually pulls off and takes a piece of the bone with it. Um, Wait, what left, was it? A hamstring avulsion fracture. So this is in the back of his knee. And it pulled a piece of the bone off. Like it, it pulled so bad that he had to get that surgically repaired. And then 2021 saw him Gross. Miss, yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Uh, I saw him miss uh, five games to a nagging ankle injury and 2020 saw him miss 14 games to a neck injury that required surgery. Like I, I remember doing this and I'm like, I don't have as much time. Like this isn't my team. I want to give some context, but I can't look at every single injury this guy has. And I think <laughs> the neck injury, I think it had, I can't remember. I found some stuff on it, but I was like, you know what? It's just the generalities. I don't need to have all the extra stuff, but like he's had a lot of stuff. And I mean, I know there's other offensive tackles we'll get to that have had injuries like this too, but like, I understand why they signed him, but like, good God, he's, he's practicing twice in the three weeks they've been to camp. <laughs> it's he's, he's constantly dealing with tight, soreness or, Hey, we're going to send him out. He's going to do individual drills. Like I it, just, <laughs> I, I, well, I don't know what his contract I, is. When I put him, when I put him on this list to talk about, yeah. I didn't realize what a disaster that is. He said, who is it? Missy Elliott, my neck, my back, my hamstring and my crack. Like that, <laughs> that dude is out of control. Yeah. It's the, the, he's <laughs> just how do you how do you get him to the regular season? Maybe I, that's why he's not practicing. Yeah, I think that's the game plan. They say, well, we're just not going to practice at all. You're going to get out there, run a few plays and then sit down and relax. He has a one year, six point five million dollar contract, which actually is pretty good yeah. given his, his background and everything else. So I think they're hoping that he's going to get out there and, you know, just play like they had Dwayne Brown do that last year and he did pretty good. And they, they just it helps that they were able to take a, a tackle in the first round. Yeah. It helps. It mitigates some of it. Now, Mike Williams. Well, hold on. I want to go back to Siren Smith real quick. Here. Okay. I texted you about the Seagram's bet. Yes. Okay. I will make a Seagram's bet that if he goes on injury reserve at any point in the year, I'll drink a Seagram's. If he doesn't, you have to drink a Seagram's. You th- wow. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm, ta- I'm taking. I assume that he's going to go on. He I'm, wants in. Yeah, but he's I'm like I'm willing to bet my. <laughs> yeah. So Kyle comes on the comes on the rock pile report and is immediately willing to sacrifice his liver. He goes, this is how sure I am. Yeah. I mean, if he doesn't, I'd like to sit there and watch you and, you know, the Jets would benefit of that. But it just, I, you know, I, this is what happens when you take the Hippocratic credit oath. I, I never think, had to take that. So you, oh, he didn't. No. Good. But you know what? You're a, <laughs> being a get, getting to carry the title of doctor. You generally don't want ill for people. No, I don't. You don't wish injuries because you work on injuries maybe, all day long. Maybe Nazis and pedophiles, but, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. What is the, uh, here. Or if we have all these Seagram's bets here. Uh, what is the bet again, Kyle? So, so the bet is down. Tyron Smith ending up on injured reserve at some point in the season. If he does, I drink a Seagram's. If he doesn't, Drew drinks a Seagram's. Done. I'll take that bet all day long. So now... God, it's. I love that you have a board dedicated to this now. Hold it up for the camera. Well, there is some gotta, nonsense. We got to go. To, yeah, this is our uh, Seagram's <laughs> board. Uh, if we can go through a breakdown here. Nate Geary is still paying off a Baker Mayfield MVP. <laughs> I'm pretty. I think he we he already did one for Jake Fromm getting a touchdown pass. Yep. We got a Sabers one on there. Uh, Doug hasn't been. Back to finish this, but yeah, the, and Drew, you got to drink one for OBJ signs last year in week 17. Yep. Yeah, th- these are our uh, Seagram's bet. 
We're like Lannisters. You we know, never forget. If you do want to change it, we have... <laughs> yeah, you put that away. You get that the hell away from we me. We have Malort now. No, we don't. In the studio. So We if you need, don't have anything. Yeah, so <laughs> We are going to get liver there damage from that. I can smell it from over here. Mike Williams. Mike Williams is one of the reasons that the Jets feel better about their skill positions this year. But at the same time, this is he's had some injuries over the course of his career, and then he's coming off of an ACL tear. What is – I think we all understand now. We've all watched enough football to understand that when you tear your ACL, the next season, it's rough sledding to get back to what you were. When it comes to Mike Williams, I don't know – your prognosis on when they can expect him to be ready, full go, and I because I don't I don't know that it's this season. I mean, he was removed from pop, so he's able to start practicing and ramp up, and there's certainly enough time for him to get ready for week one. So, uh, week one is certainly in play. It's just getting on the same page as Aaron Rodgers, and we already know he has issues with getting everybody on the same page with Garrett Wilson and all the other offensive players. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of as long as he can get up to speed. I know he's talented. I know he can get out there and, and catch the ball and do all the things he needs to, but is Aaron Rodgers going to get him the ball where he needs to, to really create that, that play, or is it going to be catch and go down? Um, well, this is what's fun. Aaron Rodgers has no experience with the rest of this wide receiver group. Yeah. So when you go to our lads and you look at their depth chart and see. It's bad after Garrett Wilson. Will you see Mike Williams penciled in as a starter? Yeah. Right there that gives me pause. So you got one and two, and then it drops off hard after that. It's Xavier Gibson in the slot. Behind that, you have rookie Malachi Corley. Which, here yeah. we go. It's right up yep. here on the monitor. Yep. Rookie Malachi. And then remember how much they hated Alan Lazard? Yeah, it should scare everybody that he's still on the roster yeah. and he's the guy behind Mike Williams. Also, none of these guys had experience with Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. So now they're all getting acclimated to a new quarterback all over again. So it's a learning curve for everyone. I mean, it's not new... just Garrett Wilson, not just Xavier Gibson, but also Mike Williams, who's, oh, by the way, also trying to come off a devastating injury. Yep. New injury, new team, just everything else new about it. I don't expect him to get back to what he was. I, I don't know what his best season is, but like, I don't expect him to get back up to that. Maybe next year. But it's just going to take time, especially with the speed. He has the benefit of dictating the action instead of reacting to it on defense. But still, like, I wouldn't be surprised if you see him on the injury report due to hamstring or knee because it's sore or something like that. So it's just – it's good they can come back. He'll be a weapon, but he's not going to be that weapon that we saw in uh, now Los Angeles. And I believe he's playing on a one-year $10 million yeah. deal. Yeah. Which is insanity for a guy who you don't know can start for you week one. The market dictates the money, which is crazy. I mean, he's not worth $10 million right now, but the market dictates he can make that. So, I mean, I'm looking at this thinking to myself, when I see this, you've got an injured a quarterback working his way back. Yeah. You've got a wide receiver, too, who's working his way back. Those two have never even played together. Garrett Wilson has yet to catch a pass from his quarterback in a real game. Yep. Then you throw in the fact that their tight end depth chart is a mess. It's this, they, they didn't change anything from last year. So there's no real overwhelming talent there. And then they have Brees Hall. This is an offense that for Bills fans, if you're thinking about it, like you complain about what we have and how our cupboards bare. This is a team that traded for a quarterback to go all in on like a championship run. And they have a cupboard that's more bare than ours. It's pretty sad. <laughs> that's sad. You say sad. I say hilarious. Now, the Miami Dolphins. And this is where this show gets interesting, right? Because the Miami Dolphins have been very strange about the way they've handled their injury report this offseason. And a part of me thinks some of it's because it's it might be kind of messy right now. They have a, a multitude of undisclosed injuries. Chris, if you want to do me a favor, give it a goog, throw it up on the screen. Just Miami Dolphins injuries, and then go to the ESPN link that's there. They're almost like the Patriots South because Patriots are known for being undisclosed all the time, and they're still doing that nonsense even with new coaching staff or everything else. So with this in mind, what do you think leads a team to being so tight-lipped about their injuries, like the way the Dolphins have so far this offseason? Everything's in undisclosed. This guy's missing practice. This guy still isn't on the field. Um, I... 
I don't have a great reason off the top of my head. I mean, the Bills are pretty forthright about their injuries. Uh, some other teams are pretty straightforward with it. They might not give you a ton of information, but they'll at least give you the body part. We're getting a little undisclosed. I mean, look at the screen. Javon Holland, undisclosed. <laughs> Jalen Ramsey, undisclosed. Odell Beckham, still on pup, undisclosed. Um, you know, we won't get a ton of information. I I don't have a good reason why they're being undisclosed. Maybe that they think that they're more chronic lingering injuries and that if somebody gets a wind, wind of what's going on, they get more game plan against it. So if they say, hey, we don't say anything, they can't problem solve or, or game plan against what this guy could be dealing with. That's a theory, but I, it's got to be frustrating for someone like you. Yeah, because I type up stuff and I'm like, this guy's undisclosed. We don't see anything. Sometimes you might get some, oh, he was seen with a boot on or, hey, he has a sleeve on his arm or so something So you like know what to look for oh, yeah. as part of your process on how you guys, how you kind of diagnose an injury. Yeah. You at least get some context clues at least support what you're saying and doing. But with this, like, I do watch the Miami Dolphins, you know, uh, press releases, or at least I see what's going on, on Twitter and stuff. But I am not looking at the film as closely. I am trying sure. to get context clues because once again, there's so much information, not enough time, unfortunately. But also, too, it just sometimes they're just not given a whole bunch of information to begin with, and it's just you kind of go off of what you can. And and this sounds like one of those situations where the Dolphins are actively suppressing the release of information regarding their players' injuries. And it is funny this OBJ on the pup list, so. I've seen Dolphins fans beating their chest about how like, oh, yeah, this is especially today, especially today. I have seen Dolphins fans beating their chest about just like, oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, injury for the Bills. That's huge. The division's ours, blah, 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 blah. And I go, guys, you said the same thing when you signed Odell Beckham Jr. You were like, this is the reason that our offense isn't going to fall apart down the stretch in December again. This guy's not even practicing. Yeah. He's been out running and lifting, but like he's still not active to pass a physical. So the question is why? And that seems strange that, again, it's another undisclosed thing that they're not quite saying. Like, Because you'll see sometimes they're like, oh, this guy, he had a back injury. And so he's working on it. He's on the pup. Fine. Oh, this guy had a hamstring tweak and he's working through it, but he'll be off the pup soon. The, the Dolphins aren't giving us anything. No. And I've looked at pictures of Odell. I mean, he's covered with tattoos, which does make it more difficult to find scars or sure. I've tried, you know, stuff like that. But he's moving his knees pretty good. You know, he did have ankle injury last year with the Ravens that cost him, uh, what was it, uh, two games, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, I don't know what it was there. But there wasn't anything that stood out last year. So this could happen in, you know, the uh, the off season, And a lot of times we don't get information on that, especially when you sign with a new team. They could have had... You could have had something lingering that he finally got cleaned up but that he still needed to come back from. I mean, I just I, – I wish I had more information on it. Sure. He's an older player. He's been, what, 10, 11 years now? He's he's had his fair share of injuries, including the ACL, which cost him you know a whole year after the initial injury. So he could be dealing with kind of a bulky knee because we know that the first ACL surgery didn't take or they said the complications was that. So if that knee wasn't moving as well as it needed to, they're coming shifting in there, causing arthritis and leading to you – know, um, the tissue breakdown with the, the bone and whatnot there. So that could be leading to him having problems and just trying to say, hey, let's take the Tyron Smith approach or Tyron Armstead where it's, hey, let's slowly get you out there, save you for the season. <laughs> Once again, all hypotheticals, I'm just trying to go off of what injury history is because that's what I do. I look at the injury history and say, hey, are there potential problems down the line? You know, I'd be worried about the uh, Odell Beckham's knee, but I have no proof to say that that's what's causing this. Now, speaking of Tyron Armstead, the, the, the dude's practicing? He is a little bit more than Tyron Smith, but not much. <laughs> the, the the big difference with him is at least the Jets got Tyron Smith cheap. Uh, they're still paying a ton of money for Tyron Armstead, and he is a fantastic player. I respect the hell out of him, but he cannot stay on the field either. And he had so many injuries, and he had the he's still dealing with the right knee issue. I can't remember the same side that he had the M cell sprain against the Bills last year, but it just you you look at something, you pay less money to guys, and you're like, what are we getting for this guy? I know he can perform when he, he's asked upon, but like. He's not ready the, the, and when you need him. It's just. Well, and I think, and this is something we're going to address in a little bit, but uh, you got to be careful what you say about that because, especially today, <laughs> there's there's some things to be said about making a ton of money and lack of availability. Now, when you look at the rest of the offensive line, one of the things that stands out to me with the Dolphins is Aaron Brewer and the hand injury that they say he sustained. And he's called week to week. Do you have any insight on that? 
I might. Once again, there's been so much information, especially mm-hmm. today. I do try to keep up with the stuff, and I think I do a pretty good job at it. But sometimes it's just, you know, so much stuff coming in, you can't keep up with sure. it. There. So let me look at one other thing here, and I might have some information. But because well, the, here's here's why I ask. Yeah, Aaron Brewer. When you think about like we had Alfar Tiaga on the show after free agency, talking about reasons we were excited about yeah. each team's kind of setup, and he liked the signing at the time because he goes, oh, he's a great athlete. He was reliable. He didn't cost much. Mm -hmm. So it's a low cost gamble for the team, which I think is crazy because you're trying to prop up a quarterback who you didn't want to, you were kind of in or out of whether you wanted to give them a contract in the first place and a guy who you know needs protection. Mm -hmm. They made a conscious decision not to roster another legitimate backup center. Well, they got Liam Eikenberg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for as raw as today has been, Kyle, I needed that laugh. Yep. You, you, you want to know, guys, do you want to see how bad it got? Liam Eikenberg is their new starter right now without Aaron Brewer at center. He His first game ever playing center came against the Buffalo Bills in week four last year. That didn't go well. Uh he registered a 4.2 out of 100 for pass blocking, according to Pro Football Focus, which you can say what you want about their ratings. and their. He gave up two sacks, five pressures, and two tackles for loss. As a center. I'm pretty sure they shoot you in the parking lot for that kind of performance, like a horse. Like, they just take yep. you outside, and they just put you down and then dig a hole. And they don't dig it far because that's not how you bury horses. Right. You just you just dig the hole next and just push it in with the loader. I know this because I've unfortunately don't make jokes about North Collins, Chris, but I have seen a horse funeral or two. I was going to say you buried a horse (laughs) on the year. Eichenberg gave up five sacks, three hits and 20 pressures playing it for like half the time. That's not good. Not good. And I did find some information on him. He it did have his right hand examined by trainers on August 7th. He's been week to week. He, you know, it's a snapping hand. So then you worry, is there <laughs> some kind of broken hand? Um, it, I, I haven't seen anything else since then. But yeah, it's a snapping hand. It's a little more serious. If it wasn't a snapping hand, put club on and get back out there. Sure. So um, it's just a problem It's because it's his right snapping hand. So past that, we don't know. But week to week is usually never great when it's something as specific as that. So then you take into account the fact that Isaiah Wynn, who played for them last year and wasn't terrible right up until he just like egregiously tore his hamstring, right? So, or was that a quad injury? It was a quad injury, and he was with the Patriots, I believe, last year. No, no, no was he? he was, was with Miami. Okay. Yeah, because so, the Patriots got jettisoned him from the roster. Yeah, they, they put him on injured reserve pretty quickly, but I don't know if he had a quad tendon tear, but if it was, that would make sense why he is knocked back. And I remember Mike, Mike McDaniel said that there's been some compounding issues, and they mm-hmm. all go on to details with that. Of course but, they don't. Yeah. So and that might be what it is. He did have a quad dead tear. I don't recall him seeing surgery, but I remember it was, hey, he went out and then it was quickly on IR, but there was never any designations to a surgery or this or that. So. so when I look at their offensive line, they've got a starting left guard that's still on the pup list. Behind him, his backup is Liam Eikenberg. Oh, wait, he's your center. Yeah. And he sucks at both. So I don't care. Mm -hmm. You have Teron Armstead, who, like Tyron Smith, is a ticking time bomb for injuries. It's not a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. It's when with him. Mm -hmm. Like, when is he going to miss a start? Yeah. Then you've got what Robert Jones coming in to play guard where he wasn't terrible, but also you're through. This will be his. He's going to what rotate centers over the course of the season and throughout camp. How is there any continuity there? This is a football team that watched its offensive line fail it terribly down the stretch last year. And intentionally, I mean, they, they, they did draft a tackle in the second round, so I'll give them that. Yeah. They tried. But they lost Robert Hunt in free agency. Oh, well, he was freaking expensive, so. And I then don't blame never him. made an attempt to address the interior offensive line at all. This is why you have to have backup plans. You have yep. to have experience. You have to invest both draft picks and free agent capital. Even if it's, even if these guys are like, hey, he started five games once before. They're NFL football players. At least you know you're not turning it over to rookies. Yep. Just because your starting center went down. Or, oh, by the way, we're going to move a guy who we know sucks at center 
to uh, to play the position. And then we'll just backfill guard with rookies and other guys who suck. That's how your quarterback is injured. But that's and that's the world the Dolphins live in. I'm not going to lie. Their line has the opportunity to do one of the funniest things of all time. And just get, <laughs> again, we don't want to wish ill will on anybody. But, Chris, would you like it would be somewhat fitting if they were to shell out all this money for a quarterback and then just absolutely cheap out and half ass the offensive line and have that blow up in their face? Isn't that what the Colts does, Andrew Luck, though? Yes. Yeah. Well, we saw that with. They're taking the Grigson approach to team building. Well, no, we saw this with the Bills and the Jets. The Bills drafted Josh Allen. The Jets drafted Sam Darnold. The Bills went, we got to build an offensive line. And then the Jets went, we need linebackers. Well, yeah, we, we need said, a $19 oh, million okay. dollar linebacker. They, they tried to get C.J. Mosley and Anthony Barr in the same free agency cycle, and Anthony Barr bailed on him at the last yeah, minute. I remember that. They were so worried about getting linebackers and cornerbacks and wide receivers mm-hmm. that they never built a line. They got a running back before they signed their first offensive lineman. Yeah. And how did that work? <laughs> How many years uh, playoff drought? Yeah, exactly. Like a playoff drought. Hey, they made it last year. They might as well not have. <laughs> Chris, you don't want to see your team get beat up like that on primetime, do you? No. <laughs> that's that's ugly. And then ugly, you've got the New England Patriots. And I don't have a whole lot to say about them. I mean, they traded away Matt Judon. It's pretty much a full scale. Like, it's fire sale. It's it, the, the Judon trade. Knowing that Judon does not have an agreement in place with the Falcons for a new contract basically underscored one thing for me. It's that Matt Judon looked at the Patriots now and said, listen, I don't care where I go. This is going to suck, and I don't want to be a part of it. We're the only franchise that doesn't have a guy making north of $20 million on their roster at quarterback. We're the only team with this just wild roster that has like limited talent and is already absorbing injuries. Get me. I'm not wasting my one year on six and a half million dollars that I hope to parlay into an extension yeah. somewhere. I'm not going to waste it here. And when people were like, well, he's trying to go to a contender. He went to the Falcons. They got the pieces, but they haven't proven anything yet. The Falcons are a team that can compete only because they play in the worst division in oh, football. That too. That so, too. I guess he might see the playoffs maybe again. Yeah. But it's it really does tell you what a mess things are. And then you start looking at what's going on. Like, first of all, Christian Barmore, he is now the best player on their defensive line. And he's missing time with blood clots. Yep. What happens in that sort of a scenario? Like, explain that. So I want to address some of the Judon real quick first here. Yeah. So he he was recruiting. He was Mr. Patriot in a sense because Tom Brady wasn't there anymore. But he sure. was recruiting and doing stuff like he was bought in. And then I'm sure he looked around and said, hey, I need to get compensated well for what I am doing. And they wouldn't give it to him, which is crazy because they're throwing up money everywhere else. Chris, do you remember the day he was on Twitter and every time a free agent would sign like Allen Robinson signing with the Rams, knowing that the Patriots had made him a bigger offer? Yeah. And he was just like live tweeting free agency with just different gifts. Yeah. That might have been the best thing he's done. And he got in an argument. Well, not an argument, but uh, back and forth with Sal Capaccio. You know, he was just, he'd Sal mention something and he's like, hey, unless you try help recruiting, you know, buzz off or whatever. <laughs> so, but like this guy was I bought in it. and did everything else. And then it's like, they don't want to give him the money. And it's like, yeah, I would go anywhere else. Like he saw the right in the wall. Now it's like, you're not going to pay me because money talks. He'll stay around, but you can't even pay me. Find me somewhere else. And the fact they don't trade him without a contract in place says that, you know, they were, they were just looking to he he wanted out I so hope, badly. I hope that that pick he got traded for is twenty eighth overall in the third round. <laughs> Might be. I don't know. That would make perfect sense. Twenty eight three. So but going back to your original question, though, Barmore. Barmore. Now what do they do? Because they've got this guy who's supposed to be a key cog in their defensive line, and he's missing practice time due to blood clots. And I just I worry about. Like, I just recently fractured the face of my shin, and that was one of the first things they said to me is they were like, well, you got to go get a sonogram because you might have blood clots. I didn't do it because I'm an idiot. <laughs> and I just <laughs> is also I was like blood clots. Eh. And then I see this and I go, wait, why is he missing yeah. games for something? I just blew off. Yeah. Um, 
they had to find out what was causing the blood clots. I mean, a lot of times with um, you can have obesity, you get diabetes, you can have high blood pressure, you can have previous injury, surgery. Um, I'm trying to think what else there is. Um, varicose veins can be technically a risk for that because the veins distended. Uh, there's there's other reasons why, mm -hmm. um, but um, the biggest thing they have to find out why that's happening, and then once they find out why it's happening, can they treat it with blood thinners? Can they make sure that he can do normal activities without having the INR get too high where that can cause other blood clots? INR is how much I believe it, if I call correctly, how many like platelets are in the system that they can bunch up and cause blood clot. Mm -hmm. If somebody out there is listening that does this you know, lab work, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> I, it, it's I, been a few years. I know what INR, but I know I, the low is is not good. High. Kyle, is not I'm good. not going to lie to you. There aren't any rocket scientists well, listening to this yeah, podcast. You're right. You're right. There might be somebody that catches a random episode. So anyway, but the big thing is they want to find out what's going on, make sure that there's not going to be a, a new um, occurrence of the blood clots. Because if you get a blood clot and that becomes dislodged, you can you know have it go up to your lungs, your heart, your brain. Bad things happen when that happens. Yeah, and you can't Those even try to play strokes. through this. Yes. Those are called strokes. And you don't you don't want that to happen, obviously for you know obvious reasons, but also too you can't play on blood thinners because if you were to get hit, he's going to be bruising super easily. Mm -hmm. That could lead to um, you know if you were to get lacerations, they're going to have a hard time stopping the bleeding. There's so many different complications with this stuff. And there are guys that have blood clots that have come back to play afterward. Uh, Marquis Goodwin, I think, had it last year. There's been other guys like I had a list on my site. I um, don't have the article in front of me right now, but there's guys that have come back and played. Uh, it's just you have to find out what's going on, make sure it gets treated, and make sure it's not going to uh, occur again. So he's just really in a waiting game. I mean, he could never play again. He could be back in six months. It just there's a lot of unknowns because we don't know what's causing it, which is scary. I mean, he's a young guy. He should not be having this. So, but there's a lot of things we don't know about their health that sometimes can lead to this stuff. Even healthy people can get a blood clot because of a surgery mm -hmm. or something crazy can happen. I do see it in my line of work. <sighs> so then you move on to the other side of the ball in the trenches. Cause this is the other thing that sticks out to me when it comes to injuries with the Patriots. They already had to put their starting, what was supposed to be the starting right tackle, Tyrone Wheatley on IR. Okay. They're going to have to start something called Viridian Low Vidarian Maybe. or a third round rookie in Caden Wallens. Runner. Those are those are your tackle options. Yeah. The left guard on their depth chart. Like if I look at it right now at our lads, fourth round pick City Sow. He's Which, actually decent, though. He did he did all right last year. He did okay, but if you ask Christian uh, Simonelli, <laughs> he's like, I've never seen a guy look awesome one rep and then just absolutely shit his pants on the next one. He's like, it's just too much variance, which is why he was a fourth round pick. But he's only playing because Cole Strange, one of the most shocking first round draft picks in the last few years, Cole Strange, is still on the pup list. Now, I believe it's a knee injury. Yep. When you think about like big guy knee injury, you play in the trenches, you're still not able to get back. And then just center Jake Andrews goes in the IR. So there was your depth. Mm -hmm. you know, no relation to David Andrews. But their offensive line is a mess, and they still have to survive two more preseason games with no injuries. They already have 20 guys on their injury report right now. I saw that today. What? Yeah. 20 different guys dealing with some type of injuries. And yeah, between pop and, you know, other stuff like that. Yeah. But like, I mean, you got 90 guys on the roster. Now you're down to 70 and then you still have to get, you know, it's just, yeah. That's you crazy. have to survive the next two. And here's the, here's the makeup of their offensive line behind Strange's strange Andrews and a There's no experience. Yeah. Right. They have an offensive tackle. They have four players with one or fewer years on their depth chart. At offensive guard, they have five players with one or fewer years. Nine, half, more than half of their offensive line right now hasn't played a full NFL season, and most of those are backups. It's a good way to get experience, but not when you're trying to win football games. Which makes you question, with the Judon pick, are they even trying to win football games this year? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? You know, and going back to the Cole Strange, he got bull rushed um, playing against the uh, Kansas State Chiefs in like the week 16. Mm -hmm. um, he had a left patellar tendon tear. Ooh. So, um, you know, they, they knew that it was going to be a while. Yeah. Like nine months is going to be like, I want to say ideal for him, but like it's it, it, it's a really slow progress back. Like, So where does nine months put him at if that was late <sighs> in last season? Uh, 
October, early November, somewhere in that range. And that's even just getting out there. Now to play it as part of a performance, I'm not going to expect that. I was on uh, Mike Debate, his proper uh, yeah. pronunciation. I told him, I go, he he might not even play this year on Locked on Patriots. So yeah. I, he might come back, but he ain't going to be what he was even at his best, you know, at least for 2024. 2025, mm-hmm. maybe, but it's just the problem is that that patellar tendon connects the kneecap to the top of the tibia. It just it's so strong because I mean if you go back you can feel it in your knee and palpate it it's it's thick it does a lot because your uh, kneecap acts as a fulcrum for your leg so the quad contract so you're asking the quad to you know fire every time extend it out and then you know load under eccentric contraction and bend down there's just so much demands of it that thing might be surgically repaired but it doesn't have the elasticity it once did at least not right now so that knee's gonna be cranky it's not gonna move as well it's gonna get swollen. He's just not going to have the ability to push off it like he once did until things start healing back up, scar down, and then you can remodel the tissue. So that's unfortunate. These guys pay, get paid a lot of money for the stuff that they do and, you know, the injuries. But I wouldn't expect a lot from him, you know, being a Patriots fan this year. And so that brings me to the Buffalo Bills. And I have to ask the question oh, now. Oh, shit. For, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you as the listener right now sitting at home. Is there anybody else who maybe feels like, like, like has that feeling in the chest of like, oh, good, I'm not alone. Like, we aren't the only ones going through injury woes. There's somebody that's that, that, that meme out there. Was that a Pepe the Frog or something sticking the fork in the, the <laughs> outlet? Like, somebody's, hopefully nobody's doing that right now because... That's when, how Twitter was today. When you well, of course, because in a vacuum, bad news is bad news, and I think that everybody, you know, this is one thing we always get accused of, Chris. We're prisoners of the moment. Yeah. Here's what I'll say. Hearing all of that, and I know it's not gonna, it's not gonna taste good, which is why I'm grabbing a Narragansett. This beer is piss. I will, I will reach out to them and ask them if they want. Hey, can you guys sponsor our podcast? They'll go. Why? I go because I'm going to drink one every time we bring up the loser of the week because your <laughs> beer is the worst thing I've. It's one of the worst things I've had. The Bills have a lot of injury problems, starting with linebacker Mavilano, and obviously there's a lot of stuff out there about it. You know, we're going to talk about it in the live show that we're about to record a little bit to kind of lead into things, but. When you think about the blow that is linebacker, and then you think about the fact that we were missing him for most of last season, the team should already, at least from a coaching standpoint, especially your defensive coordinator who used to be the linebackers coach, they understand what it is to try to survive without having that guy as part of your scheme. They did it once. Yep. Doesn't mean it's going to be ideal, but you can do it. And I think that when you watched the way being, we all made jokes about being signing all these random linebackers in free agency. And you're like, Jesus Christ, he's really, he's really doubling down on this. Yeah. Cause he got burned Yep, and he's not going to let it happen again. Now that doesn't mean that things are perfect. And it also doesn't mean that he's finished, mm-hmm. but the fact that he got hurt the way he got hurt. And the fact that he may miss the entire season does not mean that the position group is a wash. Mm -hmm. If anything, they're still talented players. Plus, you know, somebody, I think it was uh, Greg, uh, Greg Trelone, Chris, a long time ago. I'd like to get him back on the podcast. He was talking about how he, in his spare time, was trying to develop, like, how you know how baseball has war, has war. Mm -hmm. He wanted to try to develop a system similar for football. Yep. Wins above replacement by position. Linebacker is actually one of the more replaceable positions in the NFL. Okay. Your team is so much more effective when you have stars. Yeah. At the same time, like you look at what the Carolina Panthers were on defense when they had Luke Keekley and they had uh, Thomas Davis and they had Shaq Thompson. Like they were ferocious mm-hmm. at that second level because they could do all kinds of things that no offensive coordinators aren't used to having to contend with. Mm-hmm. With that said, you can use a lot of safety play to compensate for linebacker play. You can do different things. Hell, Jordan Poyer spent half of last season playing linebacker. Yep. So we're not no one's no one's happy about this. It's a dark day as yep. I'm sitting here drinking a Narragansett. But I will say that I believe it's going to be okay because we've watched it be okay. Mm-hmm. Now one of the themes, first of all, Chris, we got to pour one out for our boy, uh, Chase Claypool. 
Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> How does a toe take you out for the year? Can you please explain that for people at home who maybe don't understand? Turf toe. That's all it is. It's hyperextension of the big toe, and it hurts like hell. I remember John Fina on his uh, podcast talking about how one season he had to deal with that. He said, I think it was like 10 excruciating weeks. So it's just one of those things you guys have to constantly push off the, the foot. No matter what you do, you can tape it up. You can put a uh, stiff insole in there. You still have to push off the area, and just it just takes forever to heal up because you're asking the toe to do so much. You're sprinting on it. So it it's just crazy that he did it so innocuously it wasn't anything crazy at the, you know you just like, okay whatever toe and then usually when you see toe translate that to turf toe and then it just never was getting better and they they deemed him day to day and then he was kind of going through the drills and stuff like that and i think they finally said this isn't getting better let's cut bait now, I, think he, I think he hyper extended his career <laughs> with that one yeah, well, yeah. Chris texted me the other day when I told him about the IR things. I knew he was at work and he yeah. probably didn't see it. Yep. He goes, there goes his career. It's well, he just got an injury or something today. Yeah, but it's entirely possible that he's just not like you've washed out of how many teams. Now you're failing to make a roster because of injury. I don't know who else is going to take you. I think somebody that gets desperate halfway through a season and says, hey, this guy's former second round pick. He has produced. Let's kick the tires on like guys. First, second, even third round guys get extra looks because of that pedigree at one point. Now, you know that this beer is bad when it makes Utica Club taste like a chaser. Yeah, that wasn't that bad. No, it wasn't. Kyle, have you had an Narragansett? No, I have not. All right. You're going to have one on the live show. All right. Shane Bichelle injury. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just his pride. (laughs) You're <laughs> throwing that ridiculous pick six. I thought he just hurt his pride. Yeah. Um, so here comes Ben DiNucci, who the, the Bills have an opportunity to do the funniest thing ever and replicate. So I, I and I've Chris, I've been trying to find the game. I did, you know, as I was doing some last minute stuff before the show tonight, I remember being at Ralph Wilson Stadium for a game. It was Bills Lions like it always was in the preseason. It was the fourth game. Mm hmm. So we were playing nothing but backups. We signed a quarterback off the street like four days before the game and then made him play all four quarters. I remember that. I can't remember his name, but he was some. Who was it? This is the question. Was it because I thought it was a Palmer. Was it backwards? Yes. Backwards. It was a Sims. It was a Sims? Yeah. Was it Chris Sims? No. No. Matt Sims? Matt Sims? So please, Chris, find this for me. The reason why it's funny is because you take this guy. Matt Sims. And they just was fed it? him to the wolves. Yeah. They were like, hey, you don't know the playbook? Doesn't matter. Go out there and take it. Because they were like, well, Trubisky, he may or may not be available. We've given him some time off with personal issues, so he's missed some of the install for the week and missed some of the stuff. He dude, might it, not play. Dude, it's look at that. It's in his Wikipedia. <laughs> it's listed in Matt Sims' <laughs> Wikipedia. The Buffalo Bills claimed Sims off waivers on May 29th, 2015. Not expected to compete in a three-way comp for the starting position with Tyrod, EJ, and Matt Castle. Uh, final preseason game against the Detroit Lions on September 3rd. Late in the game, Sims, while trying to break a tackle, inadvertently threw the ball 20 yards backwards, <laughs> creating a loose ball situation, setting up the Lions for a game-winning score. He got released the next day. I thought there was somebody else that, that got signed late, too, to play, but that's, yeah, that's pretty bad. That is one of those moments. That's one of those moments where you're just like, what the fuck am I watching? Good thing it's preseason where it doesn't count. So Shane Bichelle out with his injury. Enter Ben Denushi. Hopefully they don't do the same thing to him. Cole Bishop, the last guy I want to ask you about. Mm-hmm. Piece that, you know, we're talking about these unknown injuries and things that happen. I have a source. As I know you do. But I've got a couple, but I've got a source that has told me that it's potentially in line or in the ballpark of a scapular fracture. Now, this is camp. Again, no one can say anything in black and white terms because it's all still being undisclosed and nobody said anything. With that said, if that is the injury. What are we looking at for a timetable to return? Four or six weeks, sometimes eight, just depends on how it's healing up. With him being younger, you know, it's hopefully closer to that maybe four or six week mark. Um, it was interesting that, you know, I 
I kind of more or less guessed it at the time because they, they had it wrapped up and then they're looking at his back. I'm like, there's no reason to look at his back and then he designated, designated shoulder and it's like, okay, it could be scapula. And then there was a uh, rumor report floating around out there that said it was fractured scapula. I'm like, well, that makes sense. And then we see him not have a sling on there. And if that's the case, then that's going to be the body of the fracture or body of the scapula fracture where that's basically the main part of it that comprises about 50% of the scapular fractures. And then there's so much musculature and support around the area, they don't necessarily need to do anything for it. Now, I've dealt with fractured scapulas that require surgery because they've been so screwed up due to car accidents and whatnot. He just fell out of the air, and I'm sure it hurt like hell, but he's going to be okay and heal back up. They used to make sure that it heals normally mm-hmm. and that he has full range motion and all stuff. But we saw him at uh, Steelers' Bills practice today, him running around, moving the arm more. He looks on track at just a time thing, and you can't speed up the bone stuff yeah. so much there. No, and that's... I say this all the time, you know, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to repeat myself again later when we go to do our live show. But if you were ever looking at a rookie, I think the droughts taught us something. If you're ever pointing at a rookie and going, well, that's the reason that our defense or our offense is going to work. It was never going to work. <laughs> Just like <laughs> Reggie Ragland, right? Yeah, exactly. Reggie Ragland. Super Bowl. <laughs> Super Bowl. We drafted Cyrus Quanjo, Reggie Raglan. Like, look at us. We're, we're killing it. Adolphus Washington off the bus. Chris, I think that when you take our injuries, I know that right now in the immediacy, things feel devastating. But I also think that after everything we've talked about tonight, is it not easy to say that the Bills clearly have not only the deepest, but the healthiest offensive line in the AFC East? Still right now, yes. Okay. Do they not have arguably the best quarterback in the AFC East? No doubt. Their skill positions haven't begun to really absorb many injuries. No, not outside of Claypool right now. Okay. So with that in mind, yes, losing Matt Milano is a blow. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the thing that tanks our season. They've already proven they can be productive without him. It sucks. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to. This isn't a cope. I'm I'm really gutted by this because I was hoping that he'd be around because this is a team depleted of stars mm-hmm. and you need stars. And he is one when he's healthy. Yep. With that said, I think everybody needs to take a look around the division and recognize that we have attracted something that can still work. And in that way, Chris, what do we hit him with? <gasps> Goose Fraba. Kyle, my man, see you know. <laughs> Guys, this has been a lot of fun and I think a really helpful exercise. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where they can follow the rest of your work as more details about these injuries come out? Bangedupbills.com. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, anywhere you want to get injury information. Also, a, a new podcast coming out? Um, there is a charge podcast. I'll be doing some work on there, um, with cover one. Um, I'm on locked on bills every week with Joe Marino. And then there's some discussion with some other podcasts that I might be making appearances on during the season. I'm all over. Look at this, Chris. Much to my wife's chagrin. <laughs> I love it, brother. I'm so thrilled to watch this thing blow up for you. I'm still going. No one, no one's took me out back and you know, <laughs> no one's t- maybe, maybe out disappear. So t- 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 taking me out back like old Yeller. <sighs> I'm surprised Brian being in the show and be able to come with me, buddy. Well, and- I was going to say, I can't wait for the day that the bills just come to you with a briefcase of money and they go, all right, you've got two options. <laughs> you can right. either get in the car and take the briefcase or you can, we can make it so that you don't tweet anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got kids are expensive. I'm, Bear the bean, if you're listening. Hey, listen, we're all sellouts yeah. across a long enough timeline, right? I got a price. <laughs> exactly. Guys, this has been a lot of fun, but for tonight, we got to get out of here. I'm Drew Gear, Chris Krueger, Kyle Trimble, bangedupbills.com, and this has been your AFC's Roundup.